Therizinosaurs were some of the most unusual theropod dinosaurs, being quite unique in that many of them were very clearly adapted for herbivory, having a swath of traits that support this, ranging from their tiny skulls with lance-shaped teeth, well-developed beaks, their long necks for browsing, as well as a large gut that is found in many herbivorous animals to break down harder to digest compounds, which is evident from their outwardly flaring ilia. Coupled with their hind limbs not being well adapted to running, it makes the group, especially the more derived members like Therizinosaurus, fascinating animals. There is of course lots we don't yet fully know about them, including what the cranial elements of most of the animals look like, including for Therizinosaurus themselves, where they can be known from very complete arm, rib and foot elements, but lack the less easily preserved head and neck regions, which are very prone to being disarticulated. All this and more is why Therizinosaur finds are important to know about so we can learn more on this group and how they live their lives, which is why this recent description of a new taxa I'll be talking about in this video is so important. While the remains of this new Therizinosaur don't preserve the coveted skull elements that are so often desired from the group, they do preserve something quite extraordinary, and it is something that sets them apart from other members of their group, that being in them possessing only two fingers instead of the usual three. For additional context before getting into the dinosaur themselves, the remains of them were found in 2012 by the Mongolian Academy of Sciences during the construction of a water pipeline. The outcrop the find was made in represents the Bayan Shiri Formation, more specifically, the Ulub Kudak locality, dating from between 95.9 and 89.6 million years ago, which represents both the Cenomanian and the earliest Canisian stages of the Cretaceous. Getting the remains out, however, wasn't a walk in the park, as the excavation occurs under rather pressing time constraints given the construction going on, which did limit the search area and the extent of the fossil's recovery, alongside the fossil being deposited as part of a channel lag, which meant that much of the fossil hadn't preserved due to the finer fossil elements being removed more easily by fluvial processes. What was found was worth the collection, however, as the material recovered comprised of a partial skeleton, which included ribs, dorsal, caudal, and sacral vertebrae, some of which are articulated, alongside parts of the scapula, both of the pelvic girdles, and most importantly, and notably, their arms, which were fully complete. What was found was that they had complete hands, something which is not too common in the fossil record, which thankfully in this case shows something unique, in that they only had two fingers, the only known member of their group so far to have such an adaptation. The third metacarpal was present, but lacking a corresponding phalange and being very much atrophies, which does make them functionally didactyl. Something additionally neat and rare about them is that one of their claws still preserves the crescent sheath that would have been found in them in life, which is a feature that increases their claw length by an impressive 40%. Despite having only two functional fingers, it does appear that they would have been effective graspers regardless, given the great amount of flexion, up to 90% at their claw joints, which is quite different compared to other therizinosaurs. This is in contrast to their elbow and finger joints, which had quite a limited range of motion, being more comparable to tyrannosaurs than to other therizinosaurs, with their highly flexible claws being able to grab foliage with a grip that could encompass branches or bunches of vegetation up to 10 centimeters in diameter. This is less than what is able to be grasped by therizinosaurus, which could suggest that Duonychus would have been more of a selective feeder in their foraging behavior with their more flexible claws being able to select for what they would want out of a given tree or bush. The number of digits it seems, therefore doesn't really matter when it comes to the efficacy of hooking and pulling down plant matter, and so losing a finger didn't impact them too much given its redundancy in Duonychus's case. The presence and atrophy associated with the reduced third metacarpal indicated that this was a gradual and long-term morphological adaptation over successive generations, rather than a dilution mutation that cut the adaptation out more immediately. Named as Duonychus socked Bartari in March of this year, though having been known for reports of its presence in two SVP conference abstracts in 2015, where I first became aware of the genus, and 2024, the genus name means two claws, which is on the nose, but fitting, and the species name honours paleontologist Kishjav Sokbatar, who was the former director of the Institute of Paleontology in the country. The neat thing with the Duonychus is that this find both reveals unexpected diversity within the broader Therizinosaur group, but also adds to the growing group of theropod dinosaurs that have been known to have lost their third fingers, the fifth, in fact. Genera that have undergone such a manual reduction include the enigmatic theropod Gualicho, Tyrannosauridae, Elvorosauridae, Ovaraptosauria with Oxoco, and now Therizinosauridae with Duonychus. 
An interesting comparison to one of these two-fingered theropods, namely Oxoco, shows that despite having the same digit number, they were using them in quite different ways. In Oxoco, there is a size discrepancy between their two digits, with the first seeming to have more of a function than their second, whereas Duonychus had comparably sized fingers, which in their case, helps with more equal food grabbing. Something that I also think should be considered is the question of whether other known therizinosaurs also possess two fingers as well, as many therizinosaur specimens lack their hands, and therefore it is hard to know whether some genera, like how we have two and three-toed sloths, had some additional diversity amongst these already known genera. The Duonychus holotype is also not a mature individual, given they had open neurocentral sutures in all six of their dorsal vertebrae, two of six of their sacrals, and also in the single caudal known. Though they were still decently sized, as around 3 metres long and weighing an estimated 260 kilograms. They lived alongside a wide array of other animals in a semi-arid environment, with the occasional presence of lakes and meanders as is found from the geology of the region from the time they lived, with them living alongside other herbivores like the Ankylosaur, Talarurus, the Ornithomimosaur, Garudomimus, as well as small ceratopsians like Gracilloceratops. They also had a good deal of predators to be wary of, including crocodilomorphs, one of the largest dromaeosaurs known, Achillobator, and the recently described tyrannosauroid, Kankulu, the latter also being described very recently this year. There are also three other therizinosaurs from the formation, being Segnosaurus, Erlikosaurus, and Enigmasaurus. Duonychus is comparable in size to Erlikosaurus, but are a good deal smaller than Enigmasaurus, weighing in at 567 kilograms and Segnosaurus being a massive 1.4 tons. While the argument has been made that Segnosaurus could well be an adult of Duonychus due to the latter's immaturity and the preservation of the fossil perhaps distorting the remains so they look more distinct than what they actually are, the researchers involved in the paper describing Duonychus nest them through a phylogenetic analysis in a derived clade within Therizinosauridae, which does put them in a clade distinct from the three others in their formation. Whatever the case, the description of Duonychus is an exceptionally important one when it comes to both understanding Therizinosaur evolution and diversity, raising important questions as to just how prevalent didactyl anatomy is within the group, and also how it was an even more common adaptation in different theropod groups than was previously thought. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals, and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and with that, I'll see you next time whenever that's maybe.